Um, and then um, I'm really excited about our conversation today. It's all about art books. Um, but before we get into talking about word image and the printed page, I'm asking everyone here tonight to join me in a reflection on the Lenape people on whose lands the center is sited. Um, even though the Lenape nation is recognized by the US government, it is still not acknowledged by the Pennsylvania Commonwealth. And so as we think about the importance of documentation tonight, you can find out more information about the Lenape Nation and its history, which is actually Pennsylvania history, and support the call for recognition by checking out information on the links that are being posted in the chat. Thank you. And um, for tonight, live text feed is available um, and which you can um, click on by um, somewhere, depending on your device, it'll be at the bottom of your screen or at the top of your screen. And it's not perfect, but um, it's a transcript and it's available. Okay, um, 2022 is a really busy year for publications at the Center for Art and Wood. As we look ahead to the release of exhibition catalogs for our current exhibition titled Extra Human, the Art of Michael Ferris. And the artist is here with us this evening. Hi, Michael. Um, and as well as the upcoming Spoons to Stir the Soul, the world of Norm Sartorius. And Norm is also here with us tonight. So. I'm gonna um, be calling on both of you, I'm sure, in the course of this discussion. Uh, we're going to talk about the creative process that goes into art book design and ponder the importance of art books in our own lives. When in a time like this, where we have access to digital books that convey information um, in a physical book without the weight and footprint of a physical book, why are some of us still helpless against the lure of a beautifully designed book? And why have us, some of us still unable to part with our collections of large and heavy books, even when it becomes expensive and risky to maintain, store, and ship around? And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the center store where you can shop a wide range of books and bring some more titles to the weight of your collection at home. Um, most of these are organized and produced by the center and we'll talk about some of these titles tonight. And we also carry others by um, and about our friends and partner organizations. So thank you for joining me. We're here to dive into the symphony of word and image known as the art book. And we're fortunate to be joined tonight by three graphic designers who have experience in this field and thinking through these challenges. I'm going to introduce them right now. Um, first, we have Ash Makri. Ash is a Chicago native who migrated to Philadelphia to extend Drexel University and to pursue a degree in graphic design. Um, in her own words, after she discovered that there's way more to Philly than the cheesesteaks, I certainly hope there is. Ash has spent more than 15 years honing her design skills. Her work has focused on everything from creating strong brand identities to finding visual, unique visual solutions to communication challenges. And we've been really fortunate to be able to work with um, Ash on a couple of projects in the last year and very happy to have her join us today. Next, we have Rebecca lefil Corin a graphic designer working in publication, exhibition, and identity design. She collaborates with artists, cultural and educational institutions, and commercial clients. Her client and research practice derives type-driven concepts and seeks opportunities to interrogate the dimensional qualities of each project, from book objects to spaces and surfaces. Uh, Becca and I worked together at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem in the Publications Department, and then she went on to the RISD Museum in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, and also worked for This Is Our Work in New York. Her clients include Friends of the High Line in New York, Humans of St. Louis, Washington University in St. Louis, Open Source Architecture, Urban Glass, which we worked on together, and the Museum of Jewish Montreal. She holds an MFA in graphic design from RISD and a BFA in communication design from the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts at Washington University in St. Louis, where she is currently a senior lecturer in communication design. Becca, it's good to have you join us. Uh, finally, we have Dan Saul, who has worked in various design studios during his career and spent the last um, more than a decade working independently. 
Prior to this, Dan served as the Director of Design and Publications at the Milwaukee Art Museum uh, up until 2008. When he left the museum, he expanded his art-centered design specialty, working with museums, art and cultural institutions, and independent collectors. Dan has designed more than 35 major publications over the last 15 years. His work has been awarded multiple national and international design awards and appeared in various trade publications. And we are so pleased to have been able to work with Dan um, at the Center for Art and Wood. Um, and you'll probably be seeing some of the projects that Dan has worked on here that will be familiar to you um, when he talks about his work and practice. So um, with that said, I'm going to hand it over to our guest designers and allow them to um, tell you about their work in their own words. And then following that, I'm going to throw out some questions to our designers um, before turning to the audience and asking you all questions about art books in your lives and the importance of the book object. So um, first on our list, are we, um, Katie is, are we starting with Ash? All right, Ash, it's all yours. Thanks. <laughs> um, hi everyone, I'm Ash. Uh, as Nava mentioned, I have been in Philadelphia for about 20 years and a graphic designer for about 15 years. Um, I primarily focus on a couple different disciplines. I do print design, uh, exhibit design, and digital media. Um, I have had the pleasure of partnering with the center for uh, the last two exhibitions, um, the croquet exhibit and the current one. Um, so I'm very excited to see that Michael is on the call because I'm, I'm very curious of, of what he thinks of, of the exhibit so far and um, you know all of his insight. And I'm actually working on uh, the publication as we speak. Um, so I think that one of the things that's always really kind of interesting as you start becoming a graphic designer is the idea of um, one day looking at art books and buying a bunch of art books and <laughs> essentially having a entire library that in my house is either cookbooks or uh, art books. Um, and I think a, every graphic designer's dream is to be able to create some sort of art book because there's beautiful photography, you get to be very playful and you can just create something that feels really, really like a dungeon of the artist themselves. Um, where in other client work, you're kind of stuck with very restrictive uh, <laughs> goals in mind like you know you can't be playful you can't use a lot of colors and you just you don't get the freedom that that art publications offer um so when i approach uh art books and different kind of publications that really showcase photography um and different artists my focus really becomes on how do i tell their story and make it feel like you're experiencing the art in person um, as you make your way through the publication. Um, also try to make sure that whatever story is being told that I'm doing the artist or artist justice. Um, so that's typically my approach. I know that I went very, very fast, <laughs> but I am looking forward to hearing um, from the other graphic designers and to your questions. Thanks, Ash. Thanks for joining us. Um, Next, are we calling on Becca? Or, or um, Dan, do you want to step in? Oh, no, nope, Becca's going. Okay. okay I'm so on. sorry. I thought we were waiting for someone to say yes or yay or nay. Um, <laughs> apologies for the delay there. Um, thank you so much for having me and um, for every, to everyone for being here. Um, my name is Becca lafell Coren, and I'm a graphic designer now based in St. Louis and previously in Israel, as Nava said, and in um, New York and Providence, Rhode Island. Um, so my work focuses, I mostly work with um, artists and cultural institutions um, focusing in print and exhibition design. Um, with a particular interest in bilingual design. I've kept the work that I'm just gonna ever so briefly walk through with you here, um, focused on 
books um, because that's what we're discussing tonight. But um, I also really enjoy working in kind of um, prodding at uh, three dimensions and thinking about how the interplay between two and three dimensions can kind of um, offer opportunities, whether it's, um, you know, looking at an exhibition space or a poster or the surface of a book. Um, so um, I'll just kind of quickly go through some of these. This is a bilingual catalog that I designed at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. And one of the things that I most enjoy about um, art books and in particular, you know, the added up layer of doing it a bilingual art book is really tempering how um, uh, the design offers a platform that for the art that speaks to its essence, but doesn't, you know, kind of offers a nice nest for it without competing with it. And um, I typically find my way through that path um, with typographic research. Um, I'm really, um, my process is really type driven, whether it's historical research or kind of finding and identifying and bringing forward the aesthetic qualities of an, an artist's work and how the typography can kind of um, imbue the book with a sense of narrative and be in conversation with the work um, in, a, in a kind of careful balance. And so bilingual design inherently builds upon that process because you're then asked to do that in two languages to kind of call the content for um, points of reference that might inform those design decisions. Um, and that is also relevant for books that, you know, this is um, a view book for the MFA program here at WashU, um, where I now teach. And so still thinking about how do you bring together, um, in this case, disparate um, the works of different artists that are gathered just under the title of the institution, but not a curatorial um, kind of grouping and how do you um, think through the design for an artifact that has to bring those things together. So I'm really interested, you know, my, my undergraduate studies are rooted in bookbinding and letterpress printing. So the kind of material object quality of books is something that I'm always striving to um, explore and again, kind of negotiate um, the right amount of kind of physicality versus um, respect for the content. So here are just a few more examples of kind of printed ephemera. And this last book is um, an architectural book, actually my first at the Israel Museum. And, um, and I believe we worked on this together. This may have been our first project together. Um, yes, it was. Wow, what a project it was. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of bring together an, an enormous undertaking, a, I believe, $100 million renovation of the Israel Museum and, and, and bringing that story and that kind of moment in time into book form. And so it was rather daunting, but also um, just a, a real pleasure to get a, to work with such beautiful photography and capturing a really important history, both you know, preceding the rent of, you know, of the museum itself and of that, that moment in time. So um, uh, this was um, a fun one to work on. So that's just a brief, uh, brief overview. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to teach um, all kinds of design courses here at WashU, including um, teaching uh, young designers to think about all of the different considerations um, and kind of modes of research that inform book design. So um, it, it kind of is a, a, a really helpful feedback loop into my own practice and one that I feel very fortunate to have. Um, so I hope that gives you a little bit of an overview and I will leave the floor to Dan. Thank you, Becca. Great, nice work, Becca. <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna dive right in to uh, Book design here. Oh, we got to share my screen. And all right, can everybody see it? Great. Um, I'm going to dive into sort of the conceptual side of, of book design. And as Ash and Becca sort of 
alluded to in their uh, words, uh, you know, art books tend to sort of give you a little bit more leeway to be kind of creative and stuff like that. But um, it's always sort of with the artist, what you're trying to do is figure out how to, uh, you know, capture the essence of what their work is trying to say or what the artist is wanting their work to say and do it as much as possible without sort of getting in the way of the artwork itself. You know, there's always that struggle of the the book design becoming the hero and you don't want that to be the case. You always want the artwork to be the hero. Um, and, you know, I find that in this sort of continually digitally dominated world that we live in, there's always the talk of sort of like books and that kind of thing. When I first moved to San Francisco, I remember I introduced myself to people as a book designer and everybody like turned their head and they're like, what? Like you're a, the actual book designer, you know? And instead of just saying like, oh, I'm a designer, which was like a ubiquitous thing in San Francisco, you know, it's like, there's a designer everywhere. So um, they're all designing apps though, right? So, um, so with the book, I think that in this digital world, you wanna create a book that's an object of desire in and of itself. Like Nava said, when we were talking before, the call or the, 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 the Zoom that, um, you know, we all collect, some of us collect books as objects and it's great, but it takes up a lot of space and all that kind of stuff. But I think that you try to do something in the print world that can't be replicated on screen, you know? So you wanna use material and, you know, texture and the way the book opens and structure. And Becca talked about how books are printed and designed and it's like, focusing in on all those aspects that like you can't replicate in digital, I think is really important. So, um, so with that, I'm gonna talk first about the, the book uh, that I just recently finished with Norm Sartorius, hello Norm. And um, I collaborated very much with Norm on the design of the book along with his wife, Diane and the, the writer, Craig Edelbrock. And um, we, tried to figure out how do we sort of what, what what kind of nuggets about his work do we find and here's his wonderful quote uh, about his spoons uh, he makes spoons to stir the soul not the soup right and his spoons uh, are definitely not going to be stirring any soup uh, I uh, asked you know I once I worked on the project I, did, I wanted to buy one of his spoons I bought a little one and, and I said oh, I'm going to use it to eat ice cream and he said uh, you can't use it to eat ice cream it's not meant to sort of use to eat food. So he might make me a spoon that I can use to eat ice cream with, which would be nice of him. Uh, but obviously he creates these just exquisite, beautiful creations and they're all one of a kind. So how do we tap into the, the side of like one of a kindness? So we started figuring out a way like, well, let's make the books one of a kind. So we launched a limited edition of the book that um, uh, allows there to be different images on the cover. So we designed it so that there's a, a a, a tip on image on the cover. And during the Kickstarter of this, people were able to choose which spoon they wanted on the cover. And they could sort of pick from nine images, but if they bought a limited edition, they could put any image they wanted of any of Norm's spoons on the cover of the book. And it made it sort of very special and unique and one of a kind. Uh, and we did a, a wonderful version called the, uh, the Black Flame edition which has this beautiful spoon black fame on the cover and we put black foil stamping on black linen. So it really created this like intriguing moody kind of like cover that uh, was actually a pretty popular version of the, of the book. And, and then we also put on the back cover some wood, you know, he's a wood artist. So we have a wooden plate that's laser etched with his quote that's tipped on the back cover. And again, it just creates this sort of like engaging tactile physical thing that is much more interesting in the physical world than it is to sort of see in digital form. Uh, and the other conceptual aspect of this uh, project was um, that Norm's process is, you know, he starts with raw wood uh, and then he finds the spoon in there and the, the wood will sort of speak to him as he's as he's carving it and using his expert, you know, carving skills and whatever the wood is sort of telling him, he tries to follow where that's taking him. And then it ends up with these absolutely stunningly beautiful spoons, you know, and he didn't necessarily start out with this spoon in mind. It was sort of the wood sort of took him there. And the book also is a biography. It's, it's sort of, um, 
covers his life and how he evolved into the person that he is and, and became such the world renowned spoon carver. And so my thought was, how do we show that evolution in book design? And I started thinking about the aspects of what a designer uses to create design and its typography and paper and imagery and color and texture uh, and grids, you know? And so what I decided to do is sort of divide the book into three distinct sections. And the first section uses one typeface, which not on the title page here, sorry, there's a second, but it uses one typeface, all one color. The paper is like an uncoated stock that's sort of natural colored paper. Uh, so you feel that and you can tell the difference. Uh, the you know, and very simple layout typography wise, uh, grid wise, nothing too fancy, just sort of the rudimentary elements of design. Uh, and you know, one color photos, uh, and you know, that kind of a thing. And all of a sudden you get to color. And then there's a new paper. Uh, we have color images. Uh, and then there's this introduction of a second typeface that's in color. Uh, use of the different typefaces in a hierarchy that's a little bit more complex, uh, you know, starting to play with the grid a little bit more, uh, those kinds of things. Then we get into the artwork section and now we're like, okay, let's add color fields. So we've got like a, a, a color field, uh, the typography and hierarchy of the typography gets much more complex. And we start to really play around within the grid to sort of move things around, uh, have them positioned in different places. Uh, but always within the grid. And then what was great about this book is that they wanted to focus on the collectors and mentors that were part of Norm's, uh, um, you know, development as an artist. And so each of those uh, spreads is designed completely differently. You can see we've got consistent like title, pull quote, body copy, a photo of them and one of their spoons. And, you know, each, uh, collector or mentor, sort of the design is completely different. Not one of them repeats itself. And that's the same thing with Norm Spoons is that none of them ever repeat. There's, he doesn't make duplicates. And so it was sort of that sense of wanting to try to really find a way to sort of show that progression of the way that Norm starts with raw wood and then ends with these beautiful spoons. And how can we show that in the design of the book? That again, you know, if nobody's talking about it, um, you know, or explains it, maybe people don't pick up on it when they're looking at the book. But I think that design affects people in ways that they maybe don't necessarily know. And hopefully there's sort of an emotive response that's coming out um, through that process. Uh, Nava, do I have time to talk about another book? Sorry, I'm, I'm maybe taking more than 10 minutes. Nope, go for it. And All right, one, one more. Um, so then I just finished a, a book that printed at the end of last year for Ray Stern, who's an installation artist in New York City. And she um, creates, I'm going to play a video here, she uh, created an installation called In Fugue, uh, and it has dozens of pieces of uh, ceramic pottery that when touched, uh, an image glows from the inside of the piece of pottery. And it stays there for a few seconds and then sort of fades away and uh, it was set up in this sort of in installation space where the artworks were um, spread all over the place and the images on the, the pottery are pre-World War II uh, images that were from Holocaust survivors archives and it was all this concept of uh, exploring memory and the fleetingness of memory and uh, you know those kinds of things and um, she also, uh, in the exhibition, created these paper, large sheets of paper, which you'll see in a second, that she created different layers of pulp on the paper. And by only seeing them with light from behind, would you see the image on them? Uh, otherwise, they looked like just a sheet of paper. Uh, and these are sort of portraits from some of the, the pre-Holocaust images that are in the, the space. And so the, the conceptual challenge with this one was, how do you um, how do you emulate such an immersive, tactile, you know, emotive experience uh, in a printed book, you know, flat book? And I worked very closely with Ray on this, and obviously, we wanted to try to create that sort of engagement of like activating imagery with light. And so what we did is we did a die cut on the cover, and when you open the cover, all of a sudden the image 
there's a portrait that appears as you open the book. Uh, and again, it's sort of like a surprise because on the flat book, you can't see it. But then as you open the cover, you can see the image start to appear and you're like, ooh, what's that? And uh, it starts to sort of engage that sort of activity of like, oh, um, I've activated this, I've turned it on, I'm part of the process of the artwork. Uh, and a quick video here that shows it a little bit more in working is that uh, I think it really helped to create sort of an excitement as the, the reader dives into this and instantaneously they're sort of put into a mood uh, while they start to flip through the book. And I think that that's what design should do is really sort of affect somebody emotionally and hopefully it's engaging them in a way that the artwork does itself uh, so that they're not only ex looking at images of the artwork and reading about it, but they're also experiencing it physically, you know? And I think that is what book design does when it does it best is it's sort of making that kind of uh, possible. And one other aspect of that uh, design is the idea of fleeting memory is I designed a typeface that is slightly fragmented. There's a couple few places. And I, I worked with Erica Brask, uh, a design partner of mine that um, worked on the typography for this book. And this was her idea. And it sort of starts out with a little bit of fragmentation. Maybe you don't notice it on the cover, but as you move to the second page, more of it deteriorates. And by the main title page, a lot of it is deteriorated. And that's that idea of deterioration of memory as you sort of go through the book. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other aspects that we put in here where we show an image of the pottery without it lit. And then when you flip the page, the next image is with the pottery lit. And again, it's that sort of activation of like, I'm physically turning on that image. And that's kind of the thing that we try to do in the book design is really create uh, an immersive experience so that uh, the feeling of the exhibition or the artwork is shown in the book itself too. So uh, I have a bunch of others, but I know that I'm over my time. So maybe if there's part of it as a question later, I can uh, show some more work. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm glad that you're showing, I'm glad that you're ending with that image of the Emma Milan book. Um, very appropriately done, thank you. Um, so uh, I want to launch into conversation with the designers um, about um, the thought that goes into making art books and be uh, as a prelude to that I wonder if um, you could each kind of volunteer your ideas or thoughts about what is important about an art book and what sets it apart from um, say another type of you know collection of um, pages and, and words um, and uh, the creative avenues that designing an art book distinctly offers. And just jump in. Well, okay. I'll start, I'll start. I, I, I think that I sort of alluded to it a little bit in my, what I was yammering on about um, is that, um, you know, usually art, the artist has something that they're trying to say. So I think art books specifically doesn't mean that other books don't have subjects and things like that, but uh, there tends to be something that you can really grab hold of in an art book because you're trying to sort of bring that to life uh, in a way that helps to sort of uh, allow the, the reader to understand what the artist is trying to say with their work. Uh, so I think that usually gives you a little bit of leeway um, and, you know, any other book without with another subject, I think, can be approached in the same way. And I do try to do that with uh, other clients who are doing books uh, about, you know, history or whatever. It's sort of like trying to find that one nugget that really is the essence of the subject matter of the book. And how do you try to bring that to life in the physicality of the book in a way that helps elevate it to something else? So I think it can be done in other books. I just don't think that there's the designers are sort of taking the risks and pushing the limits of book design on other subjects where they could. And probably it's a lot of times the client is not necessarily willing to, to go that far, but also artists aren't willing to go that far. I've had a, my share of books that, um, you know, I had a 
brilliant, at least I thought, brilliant, great, amazing ideas for the book. And the artist really was like, ah, oh, that's going too far. I feel like it's getting in the way of the art. And, you know, that's totally understandable, but hopefully more people will push the boundaries of what book design can be, regardless of what the subject is. Oh, I want to connect to that later. Um, but that reminds me of something, as you mentioned in your introduction, is, is, um, is that you, in your work, you try to honor the artist um, and make sure that the artist's work is, is respected in the pages of, of this, you know, transferring something that may be uh, three-dimensional or, or idea-driven um, or spatially driven into something that is two-dimensional. Yeah, I, I view, especially when it comes to art books in particular, um, it's almost like an unspoken partnership um, where I think a lot of times people view graphic designers as artists themselves. And to some degree that's true, but we're, our goals are to try to communicate the story um, from whatever the subject matter is. And I think when it comes to art driven books, um, it's, it's really about like, how do I create something that isn't overshadowing um, what the artist is trying to say and how do I complement it and support it and really make it shine while still having something beautiful to accompany it because you don't, you want it to feel like a, a whole, like a, a holistic experience. Um, and I think that that's, unique when it comes to the, the subject matter in particular. Something that I might just add to that kind of in, in conversation with um, your really thoughtful points about um, kind of how the design is in, comfort, in conversation with the art. One of the um, other aspects that I really enjoy about art books, particularly when they're tied to an exhibition or kind of a monograph is the process of sequencing. I think that, you know, typically these kinds of books, you know, of course have really important texts that accompany them. And I think that kind of the conversations around sequence, in addition to like the material qualities that have been, you know, kind of spoken to by both Ash and Dan, I think um, really kind of considering what What's that pacing? How might it offer kind of like a spatialized experience of the exhibition or alternatively offer a new lens of interpretation of those works just by nature of, you know, pairings on a spread or the way that um, works are grouped together can, can really change, I think, how, um, how a reader might begin to see and interpret a body of work. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I, I like that we're getting into some very aspirational um, and romantic ideas about book design. And um, I wanna continue that for a few minutes, but, but then bring us back down to earth maybe a little bit. Um, so uh, what, what is the importance? And I think that um, the curators among us might be able also to participate in this particular line of questioning, um, the importance of documenting an artist's works or an artistic project. Um, because when we talk about an exhibition specifically, we're talking about something that is by definition um, ephemeral um, um, and limited by um, a span of time, and then it disappears and it has to live on somewhere in some kind of documentation and um, an exhibition catalog is one way of filling that, uh, that role. Um, so I wonder if you could speak to the importance of, of um, documenting those stories and, um, and the kind of semantic uh, uh, story that, that an exhibition tells um, through a grouping of works uh, and, and how it lives on beyond um, the close of the exhibition in the work that you design. Well, I think that um, part of the, the aspect of documenting definitely is important. Uh, you're right that not only, not everybody can go to see an exhibition. Part of it is traveling, you know, and these days we can't travel much anymore, or at least hopefully we'll be able to. Uh, so there's that documentation aspect of like, well, not everybody can see the exhibit. How do we still let it live on? Uh, but I think another aspect of the publication is that 
it's another opportunity for the artwork to be explored in a different form uh, than the exhibition. Uh, so I do think that the book allows the artist, if they're able to collaborate with the designer really closely, which I think it sounds like uh, Ash and Becca uh, have been lucky enough too, as I have, to really collaborate with artists and try to work with them to create the book they want. Uh, and we can be their sort of tool to be the designer that puts it together. And hopefully it's, it's a way to do something different than the exhibition, but along the same lines, uh, but then also obviously it lives, lives longer. So definitely uh, I think that documentation is important. And I think it's important in print as opposed to like creating a website that lives on because, you know, books, you know, we know we still have books from hundreds or even thousands of years ago that we can still have like, who knows what the internet is going to be like 100 years from now or 200 years from now or 500 years from now, right? So uh, like all those websites will just be like gone and the books will still be around. And I think that's what's important. So. I hope the no, I was, I was sorry, go ahead. No, I just, I hope the websites will not be gone. We devote a lot of resources and thought to that, but, but, um, but I hear your, I hear your, um, your point, Dan. Thank you for making it. I mean, I would piggyback onto that as well. And I think the accessibility side of it is very important. Um, aside from the fact of like, I remember being a young designer and artist and, um, you know, a kid who really was into, I, I felt at home in gallery spaces. And I think that when you're young, you're kind of looking for inspiration everywhere. And I think there is something to be said for being able to like wander around and happen upon something. And a book definitely has the longevity more so even than websites, unfortunately, <laughs> because of bugs and things of that nature that you have to try to maintain um, as I experience on my daily life. Um, <laughs> but in any case, I think that, yeah, books definitely, they're, they're, they're solid. They're something tangible where they're not going to go away um and they almost feel like a little mini adventure so accessibility i think is is why you know it's so important to create these things one other thought just kind of on the note of like time and like your the this longevity piece i think also for many artists you know one goes through phases and then there's also like the, ex the exhibition existing in a particular moment and in conversation with what is happening at that time. And I think that just the connection that a printed physical object offers is kind of like um, encapsulating a moment in time of an artist's life. Um, certainly there are books that are all encompassing, but I think the conversation that happens between you know, what is happening in that moment, what the artist is reflecting on through the lens of that book and then how that's interpreted down the line, I think offers so many insights and, and offers opportunities to really kind of trace that evolution over the course of a, a lifelong body of work in a way that um, I think other, other media can't quite grasp. Mm. And that raises another question, which is um, when you are designing um, a book and you talked a lot about interactions with artists, and I, I would also like to factor curators and writers into that equation. Um, but I'm interested to hear in your words how much you're thinking about the reader's experience um, or the browser's experience or what, you know, the user side of the design equation when you're designing a book or a publication. Yeah, I think um, I think that I'm constantly thinking about the the reader. I'm always sort of trying to figure out like how are, how is this going to make them feel, uh, and uh, I want them to have some kind of emotive response, whether it be good or bad. You know, uh, if they're having some kind of emotional response, that's getting their mind going, they're thinking, they're they're reacting, and that sort of elevates the experience. So I think that I'm I'm always thinking about like how can this create a more immersive sort of engaging experience for the reader. Uh, and that's almost as important as making sure that the message is coming across and that we're communicating the message correctly. Uh, because that's the physicality of the book. Again, you know, it's 
uh, it's tactile and people engage with it differently than they do looking at a, a, a screen. So I think that's really important. Thank you. Yeah, tactility is something that um, I want to continue to talk about in the course of the conversation. I might just add to that, you know, I, I think about the reader at, similarly to Dan, like constantly. I, I'm afraid to say it in this forum, but I would almost say I think about the reader more than the artist in a sense, because of course, like ultimately the reader is the person who's going to, um, you know, we're hoping to transmit a kind of interpretation to them. And like, that's the, like, obviously what that will be is very important to both artist and designer. But um, I think if I were to just add some more, like, what is, what am I thinking about in terms of the reader? Certainly is it legible, but also um, kind of sometimes, you know, really trying to pick apart, is this interpretive layer that I'm embedding into this book, will that communicate? Like, is it of too heavy or light a hand? And like, um, there's a really fantastic essay written by James Goggin, who is um, a really thoughtful designer. It's called the Gordon Mata Clark Complex. And he writes about kind of the challenge of, of like this art of interpretation, because of course, Mata Clark's work is so physical and so um, visible in a sense. And he kind of, uh, Goggin tracks like different monographs of Mata Clark's work and, and how designers have tackled this question of like, how do we convey this to our reader? And like, what's the right measure of interpretation so that it kind of, you know, um, conveys the idea without overpowering the work. And I think those are the questions that are going through my head all the time. Like, is, the, is this typographic reference too subtle or is it the right vehicle for um, the messaging, all of those considerations, like, will the reader pick up on this? Is it too much? Um, but I would say that, like, it, that would be kind of the particulars of what I might be thinking about as I design. And I, th and I think that, um, Dan, one of your work with Ray Stern is a really nice um, example of, of how you might take on the challenge of um, translating a project or a work or um, an experience that is so much about things that are not tactile, light and, and response um, and, uh, and a momentary sense of touch with an object. How do you translate those ideas into the pages of a book that are you know, static by definition? Yeah, yeah, and, and Nava, if you uh, wanted to talk about tactility and engagement, if you wanted to grab Merrill's uh, book uh, and you know um, show that I'm glad that you brought that uh, because um, it's uh, you know it, it's a smaller sort of gallery guide type thing but I wanted to sort of create an engagement with the piece uh, that um, sort of was exploratory and uh, it's basically just a big accordion piece that's really really long and uh, the images are on one side and the sort of essays are on the other side uh, and you just sort of engage with it a little differently than any other book and uh, I think it's the only accordion book I did and uh, it was so great when Meryl saw the design she was like I've always wanted to do an accordion book and so I was able to sort of give her her accordion book that she wanted and it goes into a nice slipcase and Becca yeah. you talked about um, doing uh, uh, letterpress printing and stuff so we letterpress printed the, the slipcase uh, and so it's just this beautiful paper and tactile and it's this beautiful letterpress and so it just sort of creates that that tactility and engagement that again I think should be explored as much as possible but always in a way that accentuates the artwork not to be gimmicky right not to sort of do designy things just to be designy uh, they should always be doing something to elevate the the concept of the story. So, yeah, one of my favorite elements um, of this project, and this was the first publication um, since my arrival at the center, um, is the treatment of the um, is of the center's logo, um, which is embossed. And I don't know if that that texture that comes from letterpress is is transmitted through this. Um, 
video portal, yeah, <laughs> but exactly. it is it has a lovely tactility to it, and and it demonstrates the um, sophistication and efficacy of the of the center's logo, and that it can translate not only to all kinds of different colors, but also to surfaces, and that it can be um, convey the the kind of essence of the center in so many ways. Um, and I really I really quite loved this. Um, but and also the interactivity of the book. I mean, you're required to perform some actions in order to um, engage with it and learn from it and read it. And um, and I think I hope that that says something about Merrill too. Is um, is the joy that can 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 come from a conversation with with Merrill and her work. Yeah, and the exhibition design concept was uh, like a journey, and it was sort of you know, not necessarily a retrospective, but sort of a lot of uh, uh, Merrill's work throughout her career. And the exhibition design was this journey and sort of the, the whole long accordion piece was sort of the way to create that consistent journey concept uh, in the printed form, so. Yeah, excellent. Um, I'd like to bring us down to earth a little bit and, and ask each of our designers to um, comment maybe on a challenge, a practical challenge that they've encountered in their work and, um, and how they overcame it or not. Because hmm. design is a practice that involves a client as well. And that is not always a, um, an easily facilitated um, project scope. Yeah, I think that um, over my career as a designer, the thing that I've grown most as is being a diplomat. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, that's really part of the process of, of the design is it's a, it's a give and take and a push and pull. And uh, I'm always trying to push the boundaries of book design and conceptual design. And I go as far as the author or artist or whatever is willing to sort of let me go. And usually it's not as far as I want to go, but if I can push the boundaries far enough, it's sort of like a balloon. I can kind of like expand it past what they normally would have done, but they still sort of want it to come in a little bit. And uh, I hope that that process sort of um, creates better work and a better book that the artist is proud of that was beyond what they could have thought it would be. Um, and I think that realistically, in a book project, I think if you if you haven't dealt with like dozens of challenges uh, throughout the entire process, you you haven't been doing your job uh, because you know with like the the aspects of like pushing the limits of how the content is presented, but then also pushing the limits of the printer, like having them do things that they haven't done before. Uh, I was going to show one of the samples of the the book that I designed for the center where I decided to use carpeting for the cover. And so, uh, you know, it was sort of like an exhibition where the, um, the artists were asked to create dysfunctional works. And um, they also used a lot of materials in ways that weren't normally meant for uh, like the way that they were using them. So I'm like, well, how can I use a material that was never used for a book before and incorporate it? And so I just went to Home Depot and bought a roll of like outdoor carpeting. And my dad and I cut it apart into squares or rectangles in my garage, and we sent it to a printer and silk screened it, and then we bound it. So I think the thing is, is you know, there's there's always challenges, and some of them you overcome and some you don't. But you just don't tell anybody about the ones you didn't overcome. That's the key to success: is controlling your controlling your history. Um, Ash and Becca, I'd love to hear from you as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, most of most of the challenges of like trying to see what's in a client or an artist's brain versus um, I like the, everyone else here, um, the end user and the reader are always in my mind. So there's there's that side of the brain where you have to kind of think of that aspect as well as being representative of the content. Um, I think that's also the fun part. So it's not really like, I, you don't even really think of it as a challenge because it's like, that's what you do every day and that's what makes it fun. And that's what kind of separates designer from artist. is it's, it's not my vision, it's your vision. And I wanna communicate your vision um, and solve those, those sort of problems and tell that story. Most of the 
more depressing <laughs> challenges come with budgets and you know things of that nature where you have this amazing idea where you want something um silk screened or you want something letter pressed and or you know the paper that you want isn't available or the die cut that you want to make is just obscenely expensive so there are um there are kind of compromises that you sometimes have to make um just from like a production standpoint that breaks your heart but you have to do it <laughs> so for me those are the mostly the the, the most upsetting um challenges just because like everybody's on board with the vision and then you're just like ah real world problems um but i i think that that's the hardest thing to overcome and you just kind of have to adjust and still figure out a better solution or another solution that works just as well Yeah, I mean, I, I think I definitely share in those experiences, certainly budget limitations can be um, challenging. In fact, one recent budget limitation will leave me self-collating 100 books and then sending them back to the bindery so that I, we can save some money, but at least we know hopefully it'll be done right. We'll see if I, if I can deliver on that. Um, and I think the other part of it is, you know, um, a natural and important part of the design process, which is letting go of your, you know, precious, some precious parts of the process and ideas. So there's a book that is going to print hopefully in a month. And in the very early, it's about, it's human for humans of St. Louis, which is um, a really amazing effort inter, you know, photographing and um, interviewing hundreds of people who live in the city to create a portrait of this place in this moment. And so I did a lot of research into type foundries. St. Louis has a really rich um, history of type foundries, um, the central type foundry, inland type foundry. And I found, um, you know, in the specimen books in the public library, a beautiful um, typeface. And I decided to like create a revival and like create a font. And I was so excited because Humans of St. Louis looked really cool. It really kind of nodded at the vernacular typography, all the signage that's kind of washed away from brick buildings here in the city. And the client was just like, no, <laughs> they just did not like it. And thankfully they went along with some of the other typographic ideas, but now that's my own personal project. And hopefully one day when my children are a bit you know, older, I can invest the time that it will take to really get that typeface off the ground. But I think in any, you know, any idea that doesn't come to fruition, it's, it all comes back in some other way. And so any limitation I think ends up being an opportunity depending on, you know, it's just a matter of time and, and kind of, um, yeah, opportunities arising. I think that's something that can applies to any um, creative pursuit is that ideas um, get ideated and then um, and rejected or accepted and then shelved for a better opportunity and they're just waiting to meet their um, their special ideation fairies that um, allow them to become real. Um, at least how that's how I like to think of them. But um, I also think that in a way, um, one of the um, advantages of a design process, which involves by definition, multiple people um, and a discussion and negotiation between multiple people is that sometimes um, uh, the idea gets streamlined in a way that serves everyone's interests in the best possible way. And um, that collaboration can, um, can result in some really, really fantastic um objects or projects that are more effective through the process of that negotiation um, which is something that i've always found compelling about design and all all different forms of design um, so i want to um, invite the audience members to submit their questions and not only that while you're thinking of questions that you have for um, the designers the illustrious graphic designers that we have with us today i want to throw out a question to um, people sitting here because i happen to know that some of us at least have sizable collections of books in their home and make certain sacrifices in order to care for um, and nurture those book collections. And so I would like to know, what is it that compels you to bring another 
another book into um, your home collection when you know the sacrifices that you'll have to make for it in terms of you know the weight that you'll have to schlep around when you move to a new location or um, the real estate that you have to give up in order to accommodate this book. I am very interested to know from you um, what makes you a book collector. And of course, I invite um, our designers to participate in this conversation too, because I'm sure you have your own collections. Um, I'll go first. I'll, I'll get us warmed up <laughs> um, because I just moved. Uh, and so this was a particularly painful experience um, uh, because I had to box up, I think, more than 20 boxes of books and um, send them to a different location. And then uh, still in the process of unpacking them. But um, I, I know that I can't help myself. Um, and I'm not really sure why that is, but when I am in encountering an exhibition or a project that um, connects or, or offers a connection with me, I absolutely have to have the documentation of that project because I want to think about it later and, um, and I want to sit and think about it and get lost in the pages of something that's been so thoughtfully and beautifully put together. Um, and I'm just gonna reference uh, this book that was published by Anocha recently came to me because we're actually working with this public printing company on a project. And this is one of those um, projects where all of the pages are, are um, <sighs> divine. And I just, um, when I have a book like this, I take it home, I um, get a drink and I just stare at it and say, you're so pretty. And, um, and it's a longer engagement. It's not just about reading the words of the text, which I do cover to cover, including the credit pages. Um, it's about the experience of getting lost in it. And I think all three of you have, have mentioned that in different ways in your work and the, the fact that you consider that. Um, what happens when somebody brings this into their home and what happens when they're, you know, they're on their side experiencing it and interacting with this object. Um, so I am eager to hear experiences of people here. And I think Patricia has something to say about this. Hi. Um, not always, because I, I, I too read the words, but what draws me that same is the experience, that tactile on, on many levels, that tactile of holding the book, feeling the pages, and this is where I am one for as a stickler for what doesn't really exist anymore, the quality books. I do the same thing with vintage clothing and, and doesn't always fit me anymore, but, but the quality of hand-sewn, seamed pieces, um, books where the binding is, is, and I don't know the technology and the, the technical terms, but it's truly sewn and made and the pages are hefty or feel like they're worth the quality of the content that's in it um, and beautiful, beautiful images. Um, it could be black and white or color, whatever it is, something that when I look at it, I just enraptured by what it offers. And it doesn't have to be classical beauty that I'm saying, it's just the concept and content that's there makes me wanna just hug and savor it. And, and, and may, that's why when you're leaving, moving, you're not moving a book, you're moving something that you, someone that you've experienced something with in a sense that somebody else has taken their ideas or art or whatever it might be, encapsulated it in this object and then when you open it, it springs to life and you get to experience what all that was in not just the 2D. Um, so, so those are the things that, that I will, I have to be careful because I'll go even to use books things. If I find a, a book that has particularly you know, beautiful pages, many of them a subject I'm interested in, but if I find it interesting as I look through and I'm learning something new and experiencing something new, it's like watching a movie again, to be able to go back to the book and remember it and in very tactile, in, in many layers of experience. So I won't ramble on more, but it's, 
um, yeah, I don't read by Kindle or other stuff. I do appreciate the concept you can bring a whole stack of books with you, but um, when you're traveling or something, but in terms of books, we're always building more bookcases and trying to figure out how we can do something to add more space to store. Uh, everyone should remember that bookcases keep woodworkers in um, <laughs> employed. So keep employed? That, so that's, that's you something to do that. Yes. Too. Yes. Yes. Support your local woodworker and buy books. Um, thanks, Patricia. I also want to ask. Um, you know, we have two artists with us who are on the other side of this. Uh, let's call it a triangulation because I think the curator um, or or art director is, is, a, is a factor in um, the way that art books get designed. So um, Norm and Michael, hello. Um, and thank you for being a part of the center's programming in 2022. Um, I am interested to hear your thoughts about, about being the subject. Um, and also Meryl. Um, from 2018. Um, what are your thoughts about being the subjects of art books? Uh, well, I, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, <laughs> there's been, uh, you know, I've looked at art books uh, for as long as I can remember. And uh, there have been several art books that have been very important to me. One in particular was um, an art book. Uh, there was an artist in Chicago named Seymour Rozowski, who uh, I really loved. And I saw a work, uh, a retrospective of his work uh, right after he died. And uh, accompanying the exhibition was a book. And I read the book. I loved the book for years. I got the book when I was about 12 or 13. And I still have it. And I read it many times. And I loved it. And it meant a lot to me. And uh, actually years later, I met the fellow who wrote the text for the book, which was an amazing experience. Uh, and so I just think about how, how important uh, that book was to me and my development as an artist. And the idea that a book will be made of my artwork and that perhaps somebody will look at my artwork and feel the same way is a pretty special thing. So uh, yeah, I'm very happy and excited about the uh, the reality of a book being made of my artwork. That's so great, and we're also excited, Michael. Thank you. Yeah, I feel I feel much the same. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I don't feel like I'm out of the process yet. Um, this has been a, a couple years of life, uh, raising the money and working on the text and uh, working with Craig on the text and working with Dan on the design and my photographer on the images. And um, it, it has occupied all of, almost all of my life for, for two years. And uh, it's been a very enriching experience that has um, helped me understand my own work. I mean, it, it, mm -hmm. you start a book thinking like, I, I know my own stuff and this is what I wanna say about it. And that's not, that wasn't it really. Uh, it's continued to evolve through the whole process. And, uh, um, it's been exhausting at times and thrilling at other times. And um, I haven't actually gotten to hold the book yet. You know, we, we just finished uh, page proofing and color proofing maybe three weeks ago. So it's, uh, it's going to be, it, it almost seems uh, unbelievable that there's going to be such a book. So... Uh, I am also uh, very thrilled, very excited, and and sometimes anxious at the same time. Like you know, how's it going to go? How, what are what are people going to say? You know, so all that's happening at once. And uh, Dan's description 
which I'm just like grinning ear to ear when he was saying about uh, pushing the subjects of his books um, to the limit, mm -hmm. always trying to uh, uh, get permission for his good ideas and uh, sometimes yes and sometimes no. And uh, so I'm, I'm the one that he's talking about or at least one of the ones and, and I uh, went through that with him uh, toward the end there almost daily sometimes many times a day uh, so it's been such a rich experience like making a piece of my work um, at like the best of that is the same experience of making this book so uh, I can't wait to see it either so I'm so excited at the timing of this conversation where, where you're kind of in suspense because you've wrapped up the production side and there's nothing you can do and um, you're losing sleep, but there will not be any typos in this book. So don't worry about that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but, but you're in suspension because the, the real tangible object has not yet arrived in your hands. And, and so we get to um, hear your thoughts as you wait and wait for the arrival of, um, of the manifestation of all of this work. It's really beautiful to be able to think about. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I wanna, I know we're over time, but Nashe has a question and I wanna make sure that um, we are not going too far over time, but also that um, everyone has a chance to ask questions. So Nashe, all yours. It was, it's a lot of what the designer said um, reminded me of my own creative and design process. And also like all the things that the textility of books and um, the text of, and even though it starts off, you know, working on the computer, putting these, these things together using uh, digital, by using digital means, the, at the end having this textile um, object made me think a lot of my own process and why after all these years of working in digital art that I still uh, feel this um, compulsion to actually pick up a paintbrush. And right now I haven't because of fear and uh, it's been so long since I had, I'm just kind of scared to, I'm working through those feelings right now. But I just wanted to say, like, I'm not a graphic designer. I'm more of a digital artist that like studies typography because it's interesting and it's fun and it has like all these historical narratives attached to it. But I guess I just wanted to say that I, um, I empathize because of my own work and my own experiences, even though I work in probably completely different ways and completely different media and uh, I've had experiences with uh, clients and working with people, and they always haven't been positive, but you always, always, always learn something from them. And I believe that's probably the most important. Thank you so much. Well, I could not imagine a better way to sum up um, this conversation. And um, if there are no further questions, I just, I don't want to thank everyone for being here. This is, um, this is such a meaningful conversation to me. And, and I, and I hope that we have a chance actually to continue it going forward. And I'm sure that, you know, being that um, I've had the pleasure of working with these three amazing um, and creative and innovative designers, um, and, and I'm, I'm so honored to have been able to do that, um, that I know you'll be seeing more of them in the future here. And um, so with that, thank you all. Thank you, Meryl and Norm and Michael. Thank you, Ash and Dan and Becca um, and everyone here tonight and Albert who introduced Dan into the Center for Art and Wood um, many collaborations ago. Um, uh, and thank you, Katie and Nache, and um, everyone who's here, um, Sarah and Ron and Jude and Patricia and Lauren, it's good to see you and um, I look forward to the next run. So thank you so much. Think about books, continue to support book designers and artists, buy books. 
Thank you, Nana. Good evening. By art. Always by art. By art. By art first and book second. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thanks, everyone. And Thank you to all those people who are pouring their heart and soul into the books to make them. The rest of us who buy them who aren't artists truly appreciate it. Absolutely. Over and over and over again. Good night, everyone. Good night.